Hello everyone, this is Jason Kendall and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. This time we're going to be talking about masses, luminosities, and ages. So we're really getting to the important stuff in the HR diagram here, which is what we really can learn by looking at the HR diagram in great extent. Once again, the HR diagram is a plot of the luminosity up and down versus temperature left and right with increasing temperature going to the right, to the left. And cooler stars on the right, hotter stars on the left, dimmer stars at the bottom, and, and brighter stars at the top. And by brighter, we mean more luminous, not brighter in the sky. And that's a difference that is important to note. But there's an incredibly important element to the HR diagram, and that's the main sequence. And the main sequence is where up to 80 to 80% 80 of all the stars in the sky live. So if you make this plot, the giants and supergiants and white dwarfs are the minority of all the stars. Everything pretty much is on the main sequence. So let's see what the consequences of this, this observation are. So the first thing we looked at was last time we talked about the radius of stars and we demonstrated all of the various radii that stars can be from, from white dwarfs all the way up to supergiant stars. But we find that if we met, take for specifically main sequence stars, the radius of the star doesn't vary a huge amount. It varies from about like 10, like 10 percent the, the, the radius of the sun for, for stars that are about 10% the radius of the sun for stars about half the mass of the sun, all the way up to only about 20 times, uh, 10 times or so the radius of the sun for, for very massive stars. So the radius of a star for a main sequence isn't really that big. And the sun is only about 10 or so times smaller in diameter or radius than the largest, most massive stars. That's interesting. So the so the temp the radius of that doesn't vary uh, varies only small with respect to the mass. However, even though the radius and mass vary roughly about the same, the luminosity and mass do not. So really, really massive stars are extraordinarily luminous compared to the sun, and really dim small mass stars are extraordinarily underluminous compared to the sun. So while the radius, let's go back and look. The radius of a star for main sequence varies almost the same as the mass. As you can see, the radius ranges from about 1 to 10 solar masses, but the 1 to 10 solar radii, meaning compared, the, compared to the, cell, the radius of the sun, but the, and the mass varies about that too, roughly between about a tenth or so or 10% the mass of the sun, only up to about 20 times. So these are roughly in the same bucket. But if we look specifically at luminosity, it's really not the same. So we have to then ask the question, wow, this is really interesting. If the radius doesn't vary that very much across this, but the luminosity does, then there must be some sort of relationship between the mass and the temperature of a star. And there is. And in fact, there must be an incredibly important relationship between the mass of the star and its luminosity, as we can see here. So for main sequence stars, the stellar luminosity is a definitive function of mass. And let's see what we really mean by that. We can kind of get into some details, but let's bring it back to an HR diagram sort of look. Because if the star's mass is a function of its luminosity, as we saw previously, then, and therefore, if the main sequence is where most stars live on the HR diagram, then mass is the sole determinant of where a star is on the main sequence. And therefore, we can also then relate the surface temperature to the mass. And we can do that pretty well because there's the, the, the luminosity radius temperature relation that we looked at before. So now we can actually try to link the mass of the star to its surface temperature. And, and therefore, the surface temperature, as we, re as we looked at previously, is the only thing that determines the spectra. So really, if we can figure out a, this, a very good relationship between the mass of a star and its temperature, and the temperature for main sequence stars is all is extra is uh, deeply linked to the spectral classification. Then, if you know the spectral classification of a star, you know its mass. And all you have to do to determine the mass of a star is look at its spectrum, as long as it's a main sequence star. All right, that's really interesting. And let's see how well we can know that. 
Um, this is, again, the mass, mass luminosity relationship that we looked at for, before in the binary star lecture uh, by T.J. Henry that shows definitively that there is in close binary stars in the solar neighborhood where we can get decent binary star masses, that there is a very good empirical relationship between main sequence stars, that main sequence stars masses and their luminosity, and therefore their, their spectral type. So you can see on this graph, we have the mass at the bottom going big to the left and small to the right. And then we actually mirror that with the with the spectral type OBAFGKM at the um, on the top of the graph, meaning hottest is to the left and coolest is to the right. And then we can put the absolute visual magnitude, and we can see that there is an enormous variation between, say, one hundred one thousandth of the just a little less than a thousandth, more than a little thousand, like about one percent of the mass of the luminosity of the sun, all the way up to a millions of times the luminosity of the sun. And that's up in the O's. All right, so here's some familiar stars just to give get some of that stuff and see how their masses and their central temperatures and their surface temperatures. Actually, we're diving away from the surface temperature and looking at the central temperature and their luminosities, which are related to the, the surface temperature, and how long they're expected to live. So if we look at a B-type star, which is Spica B, and Spica B is a B2, uh, B2 V, and that V in their luminosity class indicates that it is main sequence. So an A-type star, a B-type star, a G-type, an M, and then the subclassification 201, 22, and 5, and then the V indicates it's a spectral luminosity, that's luminosity class is main sequence. So this luminosity class and spectral type are easily seen by simply doing an observation of the spectrum, and that's what you can get. The And all the rest of the things that we see on this graph are derived now, presumably, maybe we can get the mass from some other thing, such as an orbiting companion or something like that. And that's the only way to get masses directly, is from some sort of dynamic thing that shows movement. And that's why binary stars and close binary stars are so incredibly important, because it calibrates the second column. The central temperature is strictly comes about as a result of the physics of fusion. And then the luminosity can be derived from the from observations taken at absolute magnitudes in the visual range and there and extrapolating assuming a black body and then we can make an estimation of how long the star will live in millions of years so we see that spike of b might only live to about 90 million years at about 800 times the luminosity of the sun vega the brightest uh, one of the brightest stars in the summer sky is about 50 times the luminosity of the sun, and it's only about three times the mass of the sun, or two and a half times the mass of the sun. So really, there's not a much difference between the masses. I mean, there's two times, roughly, a little bit more than two times the different mass difference between Spica B and Vega, but yet the lifespan is about six times longer, and the luminosity 10 times less luminous. So you can see that a small change in mass leads to a large change in luminosity and a huge change in lifespan. And if we decrease the mass just even a little bit from Vega to Sirius, the mass drops by only about half of a solar mass. The central, the central temperature doesn't drop too much, but the luminosity drops by a factor of two, and the estimated lifespan jumps by a factor of two. And then we look at a star just like the sun, Alpha Centauri, and Alpha Centauri is a little bit bright, more luminous than the sun, about one and a half, 1.6 to luminosity of the sun. And so its lifespan will be much will be shorter than the sun. And the sun's lifespan is going to be total about 10 billion years. That's what 10,000 million means there. And Proxima Centauri, the nearest star that we saw that has a planet orbiting it, is an M-type dwarf star with about a tenth of the mass of the sun. And its luminosity is incredibly small, six thousandths of one percent of the luminosity of the sun. That's a really dim star. And therefore, it'll live to be about 16 trillion years. So there's something interesting. Let's see how we can figure, how we derive this table. But first, let's note that because of that, we, we went through and showed how many stars are, exist in the sky of various types. And massive stars are incredibly rare. Most of the stars are red dwarfs, dwarfs, or solar type mass stars. In fact, the brightest stars you see in the sky are incredibly rare stars. 
and stars like Proxima Centauri fall deep in that that orange brown zone of the red dwarfs, which are much less massive than the sun. So about 70% of all the stars in the sky are less or half the mass of the sun or less. So what do we mean by main sequence? All right, so now we're going to go into what makes up a main sequence star. We're going to utilize what we learned about the sun to do that because the sun's on the main sequence and all these stars are on the main sequence. So what makes up a main sequence star? We can say that the following two things must exist. The star has to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning pressure is balancing gravity. And that's what the diagram on the lower left is all about. There's a pressure coming in from all, from all the weight of the material that indicates the blue arrows that are pushing in on the core. And then that is, well, the, that's the gravitational push, which is the blue. And then the red arrows demonstrate the outward pressure because it's hotter. So hot pressure gas will exert a pressure against gravity above it. So gravity is pulling in, the pressure is pushing out. And it also has to be in thermal equilibrium. And thermal equilibrium means that to, of the two arrows on the right-hand side, means whatever is produced in the core gets emitted at the surface. And for the surface to stay the same luminosity, the core must stay roughly the same luminosity. So all of the energy that's generated and seen that comes off the surface of the star had to have been generated deep inside the star in the core. So that's what the two red arrows mean on the right-hand side. However, if you change any of this stuff, then the, vault, the star will evolve away from the main sequence and over time change its position on the HR diagram. If we plot the luminosity as a function of mass, and we applied this because we learned that there is a mass-luminosity relationship, in fact, that's what we saw before, is that if we look at the nature of the luminosity as a function of mass, we get that main sequence star's luminosities are strongly correlated with the mass. That was shown in the previous studies. But roughly it goes like if you compare a star's luminosity to the sun, it's equal to the star's mass compared to the sun to the fourth power. Now, this, this relationship does not apply to giants, supergiants, white dwarfs. They are not main sequence stars. And you'll notice there's kind of a knee at the bottom end there, which is, doesn't quite follow this relationship. So it's not strict, as we've seen in the previous thing, that it's not strictly this relationship, but it's a good place to start. That's why we have that little fishy symbol, which means proportional. All right. If the main sequence is a mass sequence, the location is completely determined by its mass. Why is that? Because the luminosity is the energy production rate, how much energy it must produce. So if it's more luminous, it must be burning up its, its fuel faster. And if it's burning up its fuel faster, it must have a shorter life. So you know there's not a huge range of masses from, say, 1% the mass of the sun to, say, 100 times the mass of the sun. But yet the luminosity is incredibly different from low mass stars to high mass stars. So therefore, high mass stars must live shorter and low mass stars must live longer. And let's see how that well, why that is. In the upper main sequence, where stars specifically have masses just more massive than the sun, about 10% or 1.1 times the mass of the sun, 10% more massive than the sun, the core temperature rises to above 18 million Kelvin. And when that happens, hydrogen fusion doesn't pass through, this, through the proton-proton chain. It uses the CNO cycle or carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle where carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen nuclei act as catalysts in order for the fusion of hydrogen to helium to occur. And interestingly enough, this means that there is a huge amount of temperature differences or the temperature gradient inside the core is huge and, there, and the density is high. So therefore, the core is convective. And that means the center of the star really churns hard, meaning there's an enormous burbling churning. However, if you look at the surface of the star, it would be radiative. So it'd be a very different appearance So to look at hot stars. Hot stars up close, if you could see them, would be kind of smooth. They wouldn't have the convective cells that we see on our sun. That kind of the, the granulation and supergranulation would not be present in a radiative envelope star. So an OB type star or an A type star would have a very smooth appearance at its photosphere, which is really fascinating. All right, so then we do look solar type mass stars, less than 1.1 times the mass of the sun, which includes the sun. The core temperatures are less than 18 million Kelvin. 
that means the proton proton chain is the dominant way that 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 uh, that energy is produced in the core and they'll be roughly like the sun where the core is radiative transfer meaning there's not such a huge temperature gradient in the core and since that core that gradient is not so big you get a radiative transfer of energy and but that means the outside is cooler and therefore you get convective flow and so stars like the sun and a little bit less massive than the sun are convective at the surface but if we go deep 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 into the lowest mass stars between about a quarter of the mass of the sun and about 8 percent the mass of the sun and yes there is actually a minimum mass and they only do the proton proton chain but they're fully convective from core to surface that means an, a nucleus of a hydrogen atom will appear in the cert will get to the surface and then the convection will bring it all the way to the core so the entire star gets churned where the other two types of stars have convective regions the sun's convective region does not reach to the core and the convective region of massive stars does not reach to the envelope. Therefore, these red dwarfs, which are the most populous stars in the cosmos, uh, which are, make up almost half the stars in the universe, are these little tiny crockpots that just cook everything low and slow. And they make it, they make these wonderful stews over the course of time. But then they don't do too much other than that. They live a huge, huge, huge lifetime. So what happens as a star gets older? And this is kind of an interesting question. Actually, stars get brighter with age. Again, main sequence stars are in hydrostatic equilibrium and thermal equilibrium, which is hydrostatic on the left, where pressure in outward pressure due to the heat is balanced by the gravitational pressure pulling in. And then thermal equilibrium means that whatever is produced in the core must get to the surface. That means that the, the central temperature is highest in the core of the star. And therefore, if you have an ideal gas, pressure equals density times the temperature. So the temperature says the average speed of the nuclei as they zip around. All right, so the pressure means the density times the temperature. Temperature indicates that, there, that the average speed is higher. So higher temperature means higher pressure, which means they're moving faster. If they're moving faster, the density and the density, therefore, is part is defined as the nucleus per cubic cent, how many nuclei are in there. And the, the number of hydrogen nuclei gets reduced with time. And you have to have a high temperature in order to do fusion. So as fusion occurs, there are fewer hydrogen nuclei around as the hydrogen nuclei become helium nuclei. And here the P indicates protons, which are hydrogen nuclei. H over the two is deuterium. And H -O H E is a helium nucleus with two with a with a uh, with two protons and one neutron. And then when they collide, they form a, a normal helium nucleus. So the top two equations happen twice, and that means that four protons, four objects, protons, become one helium nucleus. So the total number of protons decreases with time. As a consequence of that, the remaining nuclei have to move faster. So as the hydrogen nuclei, which are the fuel, they've got to move faster in order to maintain the pressure. So in order for them to, in order to resist it, the gas has to get hotter. If it's moving faster, it has to get hotter. So therefore, as time goes on, the center of a star, such as the sun, gets hotter over time as the hydrogen gets converted into helium and the density grows higher because the pressure is getting higher because the temperature is getting higher. The higher core temperature causes fusion, therefore, to run at a faster rate. The star gets brighter with age because the core temperature gets higher. So therefore, the luminosity in there, if the fusion gets higher because the temperature is rising, and the temperature is rising, that means the luminosity is rising. Therefore, there's greater luminosity in the core, and that luminosity must make it to the surface. And so therefore, stars get brighter as they age. The sun is no different. The sun in its youth was cooler, and there's evidence for that geologically, which is really fascinating. Now, the sun's radius won't change too much on the surface. Well, actually, the sun's surface temperature and its radius kind of balance out that extra luminosity. So very slowly, the sun's radius is, is growing, and very slowly, the sun's surface temperature is cooling. So 
the temperature is getting a little less over time, but the radius is getting a lot larger. So when we see these T sub star, that's the temperature at the surface, not at the core. It's a tiny effect. So every 100 million years, the sun gets a little bit brighter, meaning less than just under 1%. So you're never going to see it on a human time scale. And it's not going to be a global warming thing. Sorry, this does not drive climate change. Although it does over 100 million or billion year time scales, that is true. It just does not do it over the last, say, thousand years, which is the dominant change for climactic change. So no, this is not a climate change driver. However, uh, there is evidence from geologic time, and we know that in the last four and a half billion years, the sun has gotten about 30% brighter over its lifespan. That's interesting. So the sun's gotten brighter over the last four and a half billion years, but it hasn't jumped in brightness in the last thousand. So all the heat on the temperature rising on Earth is due to us, not the sun. Now, how long can the sun do this? Or any star can do this process, because as we saw, Hydrogen is being converted into helium, and so therefore the total amount of fuel it has is the mass of the star, and how fast it's burning is the luminosity. And therefore we should be able to get a time that it can live, and that's what this little equation says, the tau sub nuke, which is the time that it can do nuclear fusion. And it's dependent on a number of things. The fraction of matter, F, that is involved in nuclear fusion, the efficiency of that matter energy conversion, which is the little e for epsilon, Mass is the total mass of the star, so really it's the efficiency times the total fraction of frac F times M, it should be, really, because that's the fraction of the mass that actually goes into it. And then the speed of light squared, which is that E equals MC squared thing, so it's really E equals MC squared times what you, the fraction that's participating in E equals MC squared times how well it does that. And then you divide that, that product by the luminosity, which is the energy that's emitted per second. So really, the top of the equation is energy. How much energy is produced by the mass of the sun every second, and how efficient is it, and how much will it do? And therefore, you can say over the total lifespan of the sun, the total amount of mass, assuming the same luminosity, and we get the nuclear time scale. The nuclear time scale, in turn, depends on just the mass and the luminosity. But we know that there is a definitive mass-luminosity relationship for main sequence stars. And if we combine them together, we find that for main sequence stars, that there is a definitive main sequence lifetime. And that tau sub main sequence is proportional to the inverse mass cubed. That, well, I'll let you look it back and see why that is. The bigger they are, the quick, shorter they live. And therefore, so a massive star that's 10 times the mass of the sun has only a 10 million year lifespan. The sun will live about 10 billion years total in its lifespan, and something 10 times 10% the mass of the sun will live 10 trillion years. And it's, it's interesting to think, okay, we're looking at the numbers like this, side note, is that um, when you go, if you were to go to London and say, what's a billion, they'd reverse billion and trillion. And why do they do that? Because a billion to a Brit is by million. And so if you look at million, by million, what's by million? A million is six zeros. Oh, a trillion has two sets of six zeros. So it's a by million or a billion, according to a Brit. But in the U.S., we call it a trillion because it has, well, I don't know, three or something, three groups of four, I guess. So that's kind of weird. But, you know, there's billion, million, trillion. I guess we say we say billion for, for 10 to the ninth and trillion for 10 to the 10th because buy then try, I guess, whatever. I like the Brit way, but just to keep things straight, the sun, the massive stars live about 10 million years. The sun lives about 10 billion years and a low mass star lives about 10 trillion years. And that's all because of that, how fast it cooks the hydrogen in the core. So there's some consequences to the observation. And so we go back to this main sequence luminosity, this luminosity mass uh, spectral type relationship. So if you see an O and B type star and its main sequence, it has a very short lifespan. It will not live very long. It will live on the order of a few tens of millions of years. So therefore, some of the stars in the sky, the O and B type stars that you see in the night sky, were not there 10 million years ago. In fact, every O and B and A type star you see in the sky did not exist when the dinosaurs roamed the Earth 65 million years ago. Wow, 
There were different OB type stars in the sky then for them to see, but not the ones that we see. Therefore, Orion's belt was not in the sky for the dinosaurs. It also means that we know that sun is about four and a half billion years due to the age of meteorites on the earth. Therefore, the sun is halfway through its main sequence lifespan. It's about four and a half billion years along. It'll go for another four and a half or five and a half billion years before it starts to change its position on the HR diagram. And this isn't an HR diagram. This is a mass luminosity diagram. And for the M-type dwarfs, it's really not possible to know their age because they don't evolve very much as they age. So we can't tell if a, an M-type star is a young M-type star or a truly ancient M-type star because they just cook low and slow. So we have no idea. So therefore, O and B-type stars, you know they're young. And we know that we can get, there are some observational characteristics that allow us to determine the ages of F and G type stars and some K type stars, but there's almost no way to determine an isolated M type star's age, which is really fascinating. So there's some observational characteristics of it. But the really important thing that we see here is that the mass is related to the spectral type. The spectral type is related to the age for main sequence stars. Don't be fooled by this, because if I show you a, a, a giant type M star, it could have been any of things. It could have been an OBAFGK type star some time ago. But this relationship and how old it is uh, is only applicable to main sequence stars. So how long they live on the main sequence is all we've been talking about. Not what happens after they're done being on the main sequence. We'll get to that really soon. Very soon, we're going to be going into the how stars evolve. But first, I want to show you, before we look at stellar evolution, we're next going to be looking at how stars, uh, how stars are grouped and how they're formed and how we know the ages of stars to begin with and how we got this idea that we just talked about.